Welcome to Evolution Network. I'm David Mudrick. Our guest today is Shelly Moore. Shelly has had a career in senior level management with companies ranging in size from small privately held to large publicly traded corporations. His degrees from prestigious universities of Cornell and Thunderbird School of Management and International Business. He has worked for notable companies like Mattel, where he was executive vice president of sales. The focus of his career has been around consumer products, ranging from toys to sunglasses to souvenirs. Kelly is also a world traveler. He has explored the jungles of Africa, the pyramids of Egypt, and even the North Pole. Shelley, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Dave. Glad to be on. Well, you've led a pretty adventurous life, both personally and in business. It seems like it's given you a unique perspective on the world that many people don't have. What kind of knowledge and wisdom have you gained by traveling the world? Well, I would say that the, the, the knowledge and wisdom comes from two things. One is from meeting people in all parts of the world. And secondly, from, uh, you know, from, from visiting all parts of the world. I mean, many countries are very, very different from the United States. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Asia, both for business and pleasure. Um, one of the things that I've been most impressed with uh, and has affected me a great deal is the growth of China since I first went there in 1981 through today, uh, 2019. I mean, when I first went to China, uh, for example, uh, I went to the border between Hong Kong and China because people said, and I think it was in 1976, people said, um, do you want to go see China? And of course, everybody wanted to see China. So they took us to the border and uh, there was nothing across the border except rice fields. And today, same place, same location is a city called Shenzhen, which has 11 million people. So one of the things I've, I've learned is, is how countries change and grow and how uh, the United States is uh, part of that growth and, and, and how as a, as, a, as a company or many of the companies that I've been involved with have, have been part of that growth as well. So was that, that's when you were with Mattel, the first time you went to China? Well, the first time I went to China, I was with Mattel. It was actually the first time I went to the Far East was, or Asia was in 1976. And Mattel, you couldn't go to China. Mattel was doing business in uh, primarily in Taiwan, Korea, and Hong Kong. And that's, that's where I went. Also a bit in Japan. Uh, you know, the growth of manufacturing in, in, in Asia has changed over the last 40 years. It started out after World War II in Japan. And for example, Mattel bought all their toys, everybody, all electronics, all toys, anything that came from, from Asia came from Japan. Well, Japan uh, uh, was able to increase its manufacturing capacity and increase its technology to where Japan didn't want to make low-cost goods anymore. So the manufacturing for low-cost goods like toys or, or souvenirs or, or low-cost uh, uh, housewares and so on moved first from Japan to Taiwan, a bit to Korea, and then it moved from Taiwan to Hong Kong, and then it moved from Hong Kong to China. And uh, interestingly enough, in the very beginning, China's factories were owned, all owned by the government. And you had to do business with a government factory, which turned out to be very, uh, very inefficient factories. And as soon as the Taiwanese and the Hong Kong people were able to go in and manage and purchase factories in China, the, uh, the manufacturing became much more efficient. And even today, much of the manufacturing in China for at least for the goods I'm used to buying, uh, were are the manufacturers are owned by the Taiwanese or Hong Kong people uh, employing Chinese labor. So it's changed over the years a great deal, uh, the manufacturing in, in, uh, in Asia. 
So that, I mean, that was pretty early, 76. I mean, Nixon just went there in, what, 72. Yeah. So that was... Correct. Well, yeah, when I, as a, you couldn't go to China in 76. You only could get into China. I think it opened up around 76 or 77. And I, the first time I actually went to China was in 1981. And it was very interesting. It was very primitive. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, people walked around with Mao suits. And uh, <laughs> it was a funny story. I People were using old time box cameras. You know, you can kind of probably remember, Dave, the old box cameras. And I asked somebody, um, are these pre-war cameras? And they said, no, they make them like this now. <laughs> so their manufacturing hadn't really uh, evolved to where it is today until, you know, into the 1980s. All right. Um, well, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to the early days and talk about your first job. Well, your first job was in sales, right? Right. My first job out of college was um, I actually uh, went to graduate school in Arizona, came to Los Angeles for a brief period of time and uh, met, a, met a lady that I liked. And uh, I went back to New York after I graduated from graduate school, came back to California and uh, wanted to get married. I'm a little foolish. I was young. But uh, my first job with, with, was with a company called Remington Rand which sold Remington Rand was was one of the founders of the computer business. I mean, if, if you go back long enough, you go back to the Univac system, which was created by Remington Rand. Uh, they also sold rudimentary business systems. Uh, Remington Rand sold uh, everything from vertical uh, shelving for filing, which was a unique way to file that was faster and more efficient, they also sold a system which most people ran their inventory and their finances on, which in those days was called Cardex, C-A-R-D-E-X. I'm sure, Dave, you probably never heard of it. <laughs> no, but I have <laughs> My job, my first job was at Remington Rand. I was hired as a salesperson with five other guys, three or four other guys. And uh, we were on probation. And our first job is we had to sell five products before we can become, you know, uh, taking our probation, become a salesman. Well, uh, it was very difficult because you had to call on offices and knock on doors and cold calling was something that I didn't like, even though I had a pretty outgoing personality. I just didn't like cold calling. And as I said, uh, as I probably told you, occasionally I would go to the movies in the afternoon because I didn't want a cold call. <laughs> but I figured out pretty fast that the only way to succeed in this business was to try to specialize. And uh, so I kind of chose to specialize in hospitals and utilities. And my first big sale, which put me on the map, was to a hospital converting their um, their filing system to a vertical filing system. I did it with the help of a business consultant that worked for Remington Rand. And it was a, in those days, a very, very major sale. And I became a hospital specialist. And that's what I was for the three or four years uh, that I was with Remington Rand. And uh, so what I learned and what, what I've moved forward with all my life is it's really better to try to specialize in either a, a sector of business or a class of trade or, or a product line or something like that. It's better than just trying to scatter, you know, use a scatter gun and try to sell everything. Uh, it's something that I've used, uh, you know, since the beginning and it's something I learned in my first job. Specialization. But the basic advice is there's no easy way. Just get out there and pound the pavement until you get enough experience. Is that, I mean, you really have uh, yeah. training, it doesn't sound like, did you? No, there was really no training. It was, they gave you, well, we had a week of training, but they gave you a book and they said, here, here's the product and here's your territory, so go sell. So you just had to go out and pound the pavement. It was just cold calling. And it was uh, not easy to do 
because you've got a lot of uh, you know, rejection. And uh, but again, you know, if you do it long enough, you figure you figure out the angles. And the angle for me was, I know I'm getting rejected just by going knock, going into a building and starting on the top floor and going to the bottom floor, just knocking on office doors and or talking to secretaries. I knew that was not the way to go. So I started, as I said, uh, you know, calling on hospitals, and I I was pretty successful with it. So eventually you went all the way to executive VP of sales at Mattel. So that's a long way up. So uh, was that kind of your well, thinking all along? How did you, what's the journey from getting to uh, someone on the street who has no sales experience to one of the top sales <laughs> positions in the, in the country for a major corporation? Well, I was recruited. I was going to uh, uh, California State University of Northridge, just taking some courses, and there was a job on the board. Uh, they had jobs on the board. I was working for Remington Rand, and there was a job on the board at Mattel as a detail person, which was basically just uh, calling on stores and you know uh, making sure that cells were straight. It was what you would today call servicing. And so I applied for the job and. I got hired and I went to work for, at first, I went to work for the representative because in those days, in those very early days, this is 1963. I'm not sure how many people I'm talking to were born in 1963, but, you know, Mattel was a company doing about $70 million a year in those days. And they were using manufacturers reps. So I actually didn't go to work for Mattel. I went to work for the manufacturer's rep down in downtown Los Angeles. My first job was uh, was calling on stores and, and detailing in the stores or servicing stores, making sure the product was on the shelf, making sure we got our share of shelf space, putting up merchandising, uh, help, um, uh, like shelf talkers or banners or things of that nature. And... Uh, I was doing pretty good at it, so the the uh, the rep, the manufacturer's rep, promoted me to a salesman. And I remember my first job as a salesman was to call on on. Uh, uh, in those days, there were large uh, um, uh, retailers in Los Angeles, discount retailers in Los Angeles and San Diego that no longer exist. For example, there was a company called Fedco. And there was a company called FedMart in San Diego. FedMart eventually was purchased by Costco. Um, those are my large accounts. And I did, I did fairly well at it. So I was then brought into the company. They did away with their reps. They fired all the manufacturer's reps at one fell swoop. And I was brought into the company. And I was made a... Uh, a salesman in Los Angeles, uh, working for the company, not the rep. I was then promoted, I think in 1967, I was promoted to a district manager and sent up to uh, Seattle, Washington, where I had the uh, uh, Washington, Oregon, and Montana, and Idaho as my territory. It was pretty good territory because we had some large accounts up there. Uh, in those days, the toy business was mostly distributed through wholesalers, not through uh, not through directly calling on accounts. And so, the large wholesaler up there uh, was a company called Northern Specialty. It was doing about I don't know about three or four million dollars a year in those days, which was a, which was a, a high amount of revenue. And uh, I was up there for two years, and they brought me back to Los Angeles as the regional manager for the West 11 Western States. And I did that for a while. And then the company divisionalized. They actually turned it into two divisions, one being uh, sold primarily the Hot Wheels brand and one primarily sold the, the doll brands like Barbie and, and large dolls and so on. I became uh, a... Uh, sales manager for the uh, for the doll division. And it became quite competitive between the two divisions and the company was, <laughs> was starting to get into trouble. And uh, 
I think I've said this many times, the president of the company said, well, there's only a couple of ways we can increase the bottom line because we're a public company and we're reporting to the public and our share earnings per share were very important. So what he said was, well, we got to either increase the revenue, we got to decrease the overhead or increase the gross margin. Well, I, he said, I think the only way we can do this is inc- increase the, the rev- top line revenues. So they undivisionalized. They went back to one division and I became the sales manager for half the country. And so there were two sales managers, one for one half the country, one for the other half. My half, strangely enough, was the Western United States and the Eastern United States. So I had some of the largest accounts in the country because they were back east. Like Sears in those days was a gigantic toy account. And uh, there were some very large wholesalers in New York City. I had the great honor of being the first one to tell the wholesaler in New York that we were going to sell uh, the retailers direct. Well, you can imagine how that went over. (laughs) It wasn't easy, but we did it. And eventually, I was promoted to the sales manager for the entire country. And uh, then I had another great uh, challenge put forth to me one time, which you'll probably understand. And that is Mattel had a dating program where everything that was purchased at Toy Fair was actually paid for by the customer in Dece- on December 10th of that year. Well, Mattel decided that they wanted to uh, one of the ways they can increase their bottom line was to uh, reduce the dating or that is make, make, make the goods. I'm sorry. The goods were originally supposed to be payable on January 10th, not December 10th. So what we sold at Toy Fair in February wasn't paid until January 10th. So again, uh, Mattel decided that, or the, the man, management decided that uh, they can increase the bottom line by decreasing the, uh, the the terms. So they wanted to decrease the terms from January 10th, payable January 10th to December 10th. So I go to a meeting at Toys R Us. We were doing in those days about a hundred million dollars with Toys R Us. Well, my job. <laughs> was to tell the owner, Charles Lazarus, and the, and, the, and the president of the company and the buyer, we're going to decrease your terms by 30 days. Well, you've got to know that Toys R Us did a bulk of their business between December, between November 25th and December 24th. So when, by decreasing the terms, uh, making them pay for the goods in December rather than in January, that was a hell of a thing to ask them to do. And it was a big argument. And uh, we kind of left it at a neutral. I went back and said, I don't know, maybe we should compromise and make it do it half. That is, instead of the January 10th, make it December 25th or December 26th, the day after Christmas. And I think that's what we did. So we compromised. But in any case, uh, uh, my boss, who was the vice president of sales, uh, decided to move on to something else, and I was chosen to become the vice president of sales for Mattel. Uh, the difference between vice president of sales and executive vice president of sales was as vice president of sales, I had all the accounts except some of the national accounts uh, that were handled separately. Uh, those were the largest accounts the company had. Uh, When I became executive vice president of sales, I had um, uh, control of everything. I was the sales manager for the entire company, for all the products. And in in those days, there were two divisions of the company again. One was toys, one was electronics. Interestingly enough, my sales force or or the, the, the company sales force sold for the electronics division, which in those days sold a product called Intellivision and uh, for the toy division. So I really had two bosses, two, two pre- I reported to two, two presidents of the company, which was kind of interesting, and, uh, but it worked. And we did pretty well. I mean, we built the business. In the time I was there as, as executive vice president, I think we built the business about $100 million. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, in those days, we were doing about a 
couple of billion dollars a year between the both divisions. And uh, it was uh, it was a, it was a terrific responsibility. I reported to the co-presidents. I was also on the executive committee of the company, which made the major decisions for the corporation. Um, I uh, I was also, by the way, in charge of distribution. Uh, distribution at Mattel. We had two two major distribution centers: one in Los Angeles and one in New Jersey. And we had, I don't know, we must have had uh, about a million and a half square feet of, of distribution space. Uh, it was an interesting responsibility because I didn't know a lot about it, but I had a, I had a great team under me and uh, they helped me to, uh, to get through it. Interestingly enough, when I left Mattel, they separated out those two functions. They, Separate out the sales function and and put the operate put the uh, distribution function under us operations. But I actually left Mattel in 1981 primarily because the guy who was president of the electronics division decided to uh, create create a new company in the video game business, which at the time was very hot, and he asked me to join the company as a co-founder which I did. And so I left Mattel in 1981. And that's my, that's the history of my career at Mattel. <laughs> well, it sounds like a, a lot of responsibility and probably a lot of stress. How did you manage the stress in that kind of position? Well, <clears throat> the stress was twofold, the threefold, actually. The stress came from top down the stress came from bottom up, from the salespeople up, and the stress came from the customers. We were very, very buttoned up in the way we uh, handled customers and in those days. First of all, uh, before, most of the business in the toy business, and even I think probably in any other business in those days, was done at shows where, you know, you you at Toy Fair, which actually in those days in New York, we'd run for two or three weeks, as I remember. So the first week we were at Toy Fair was strictly training. We had every single salesperson, every region uh, had their own meetings, and every regional manager supervised the district managers, and they would uh, go through role playing. First of all, they would train the people on the on the product. You know, what was the positioning? Why was the product in the line? What was the promotion behind the product? What was the marketing behind the product? And uh, then they would go through role play and they would make every salesperson, saleswoman, salesman go through uh, a, a mock presentation. Um, the second thing we did, which was very important, at the end of that, we would have a meeting with all the regional managers and we would determine at that time, what, if anything, we were going to do? What were the customers' problems? Did they have carryover that they wanted markdown money on? Uh, did they, uh, didn't we ship them on time? Or what kind of problems did each major customer have? And we would review each major customer in the country, myself, the regional, uh, the regional manager, and the relevant district manager we would review uh each customer and what the customer might need in those days uh, we would provide markdown money for example or we would provide this is interesting we would sell the customer closeouts at a very reduced price as a way of rewarding them or paying them back for markdown money and it, it worked because the closeouts were sometimes worth as much as the of the goods that were in currently in line. The, the second or third thing we did is every we made every salesperson pre, um, uh, present a uh, or or develop a uh, order that he was going to try to uh, to work this customer for. In other words, every salesperson knew what he was going to sell that customer. Okay. And frankly, at the end of the day, if he didn't sell them what he said he was going to sell them, we were pretty tough on those customers. But the stress came from how I handled the stress was working with people. I mean, you know, whether it came from above and there was always there was always pressure on us. We were a public company. 
There's a lot of pressure on us to, uh, you know, I was interviewed many times by, uh, 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 you know, the, the uh, I forget what you call them, the people who work for the uh, brokerage companies who do the, not not the selling, but do the, you know, do, do the um, uh, conversations about, uh, you know, uh, understanding the industry and so on. The analysts, I guess you would call them. I got, I had a lot of meetings with analysts because they wanted, Mattel was a hot company in those days. And, this, and um, so we did a lot of interviews with analysts, which were very stressful because you, you didn't want to tell them anything bad because you knew they would report it. So you had to tell them, you had to try to embellish the, the, uh, the truth a little bit, but managing stress was simply being able to work with people and working through problems. I mean, uh, you, you know, you went home at night and uh, you had a drink. <laughs> okay, I tell you, it was it was stressful. And uh, I think I I think I told you this day. One of the things that I never tell people in terms of my personal life, I never tell people how to raise children. But I had a tough time with my son when he grew up because when I was young and I worked for Mattel and he did a lot of traveling I would come home and complain all the time my son was in the high chair listening to me complaining he said oh he grew up saying oh I don't want to be successful that's too much stress <laughs> so, <laughs> so he so he became a surfer but uh, in, in any case uh, stress is just something you learn how to deal with over time and one of the best ways to alleviate stress is to make sure that you're working with your team. I mean, share the stress with your people. Don't absorb it all yourselves because um, they, they have, you know, a responsibility and your responsibility is, is, is in carbon, it includes all of the responsibility for people who work for you, but each of them on their own has their own responsibility and they have to share the stress. Yeah. Well, what about uh, not just at Mattel, but what do you think is the toughest decision you ever had to make as a CEO or president of a company? Well, the toughest, the, the toughest to say, well, I had a lot of tough decisions, but the very toughest one was <clears throat> I was president of a company called Stravina, which uh, was a company we, when I joined it was $13 million. When I exited the company nine years later, it was a well over a hundred million dollars. But the most difficult thing I had to do was along somewhere along the line, the banks, uh, said to me, they called me one day and said, you know, we don't like your numbers. We're cutting your line. And I said, wait a minute, if you cut my line, I can't make payroll. <laughs> And in a, in a, in a company in, in the United States, if you can't make payroll, it's okay. But if you don't pay the payroll taxes, you're, you as the CEO are responsible for the payroll taxes. So I said to the bank, if you don't, okay, you want to cut my line? If I can't make payroll, I'm laying off everybody today because that's it. I'm finished. And I, I don't want to be responsible for the payroll taxes. I said, no, wait a minute. <laughs> and then, <laughs> And they came forth, and they and they and they gave me back the line. Uh, that was one of the most difficult things. The other difficult things were trying to take companies. Uh, I was in a few companies in my life that had problems, and they were turnarounds. And turnarounds are very difficult to do. Uh, for example, uh, as a consultant later on in my life, uh, in I think 2008 or 2009, a friend of mine would actually hide me in Stravina, uh, called me and said he was a landlord and he had a company in his, uh, in his building. It was a pretty good company in the, in the uh, uh, stationary business. And they were going into receivership. And he said, Shelly, listen, I don't, I don't want to lose my rent, so I'm going to take over the company, but I'll only do it if you help me run it for a year. So I did. It was very difficult. We had to take the company out of receivership, and there were two big, two big issues. One was collecting money that was owed to the company because once you not, you know, once you're not shipping, you know, you don't get paid very, very well. And the second thing was to get the vendors in China 
to ship because, you know, if you didn't ship, you certainly weren't going to get paid for anything. So I think the second day I was with the company, I went to China and worked with the vendors to uh, to get them to open up and to ship the goods, to convince them that uh, the new owner would pay them and so on. And we did take the company out of receivership. Um, and I exited after a year because uh, the owner of the company really bought it and told me in the beginning that he, he wanted his son to run the company. So I had a son working for me for about three months and then I left. But it was difficult to take a company out of receivership out of receivership and it's difficult when a company has problems um uh because uh you know it, it, it's losing its market share or its vendors in china aren't getting paid on time or uh you know you're having problems with employees by the way the most difficult thing i ever did in business or at the time i thought it was the most difficult thing i ever did was when I had to fire my first employee. Hmm. You have no idea. This was back when I was working for Mattel and I was living in, in Seattle, Washington. I practiced on my wife for a week. <laughs> <laughs> I know how that and is. It was, That's tough when you have to do that. <laughs> I literally practiced on my wife for a week. But I have to tell you, Dave, subsequent to that or after that, I fired probably thousands of people in my life and it's never easy, but you learn you learn how to do it and and have it and not and not have it uh, you know become stressful. Uh, you know there were times uh, when I was president of Rebel, I moved the manufacturing from uh, from California, Los Angeles, California, to Japan, and um, I think we had we were unionized. I think I had to fire like two hundred fifty employees in one day. Uh, it was, it was stressful and, uh, but we did it, you know, you learn how to do those things. And I think you learn by experience. Uh, I think experience teaches you how to deal with stress. Experience teaches you how to deal with, with, uh, difficult situations. And, uh, certainly you can't become CEO of a company unless you can handle stress because it's a stressful job, you know? Where, I'm sure you had to fire some people that were you were close with. Uh, did you develop a skill where you were able to do that and still remain friends with them after? Uh, interesting enough, yes. At Mattel, for example, <laughs> I had one regional manager that I had to uh, terminate, and um, I became, we were friends and I, I, I gave him the reasons why I had a term and he agreed that I was correct and we remained friends. And as a matter of fact, I retired him a couple of years later and because he improved his skill sets and he proved that, uh, he could improve. Uh, and so we, we retired him. So yes, it, it's happened, but less often than you would think. <laughs> Uh, most of the most of the times, people are, are not happy with you when you terminate them, even if you have a good reason. And there's really two reasons why you terminate people. One is for cause, uh, or or I would say cause and lack of performance are almost you know are kind of together. And the other is you terminate people because the company just has to cut its overhead. And when the company has to cut its overhead it's easier to terminate people because it's easy to explain when you have to terminate people for cause, unless you've done a very good job of monitoring their performance and you can show them where they were wrong. And you have told them in the past where they were wrong. You shouldn't fire. Them. You should only fire people. I always prided myself, Dave, on people who I fired pretty much knew I was going to fire them. Because I had, I had, uh, you know, monitored their performance and given them enough reviews along the way and said, look, this is not right. You have to improve and given them goals to, to achieve. And if they didn't achieve those goals, they knew they were in trouble. So I pretty much always prided myself on the fact that if I was going to fire somebody, they pretty much knew they were going to get fired. Yeah, well, that's definitely the right way to do it. 
How about you? Were you ever fired? Yes. <laughs> uh, um, I was fired. Let me just think. Uh, I was at first job, second. Uh, I was fired from the sunglass company. And the reason I was fired, it was really interesting. The reason I was fired, we were doing pretty good. Uh, it was the company was owned by a family equity group. And the family was the Johnson family, which are people that owned 7 Eleven. And they owned a company in Los, they owned three companies in Los Angeles, among others. One was a company called Applause, which Dave, you may have heard of, or maybe not, was in the plush business. It was a yeah. couple of hundred million dollars, a couple of hundred million dollar company. One was Applause. One was a company called, the, I think it was called The Good Company, which was in the gift business. And one was uh, International Tropical, the sunglass company, which, of which I was the president. Well, it turns out it was a political issue. The CFO of Applause wanted to become a CEO, and he convinced the uh, the board that he could do a better job than I was doing uh, of, of managing the sunglass company, which, by the way, was doing pretty good. Well, let me tell you, I got fired, Okay. <laughs> And I got terminated with a, with a nice severance package and, and no, no, uh, no problem. But um, I think the company was two years after I left, the company was gone. <laughs> the, C, the guy who was C, CFO of, the, of Applause came in as CEO of Tropical and he was a financial guy. He didn't, uh, he didn't know really how to manage people. He knew how to manage books. And the company was actually purchased by Bausch and Loam a couple of years after I left. And I believe some of the brands are still around, but uh, that was my one experience of getting fired. I remember going home and meeting my wife for lunch. She said, how's your day going? I said, I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> and we laughed about it because I wasn't worried about it because I knew I could find another position. And I did, but, uh, it, it was an interesting experience. <laughs> well, what about, uh, tell me the story uh, about some executives that were stealing from a company that you were working in. Uh, oh, well, okay. Story. I was president. I, I got hired by a company called, with, uh, um, uh, what do they call it? What do they call it? I forget the name of the original company. Um, any, in any case, uh, the company was owned by two gentlemen, and they were. It was a publicly traded company, which is a key issue, because when you steal from the government, because you're trying to avoid, or it's not steal, when you're trying to avoid paying taxes to the government by by lumping things onto your P and L that are your personal issues and so on. You know, you're stealing from, you know, you're really stealing from yourself, not from the government. But when you're a public company, you can't do anything like that. But these people were doing three different things. One was they were uh, transferring the product in China to a company in China uh, at a very high margin. And then trans, and I'm sorry, they were transferring the product to the company in the U.S., I, 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 they were transferring the product to a company in Hong Kong at a very low price, transferring to the company in the U.S. at a very high price. So they made a lot of their profit in China, number one. Number two, they, were, they developed a product that was a holographic, uh, um, like a slot machine. Uh, and it was pretty well received. It was... Uh, first, it was first put into the Warner Brothers stores when they first opened, and it was looked like it was going to be a big product. The problem was <laughs> they were writing checks to cash, okay, and uh, putting on the bottom where you put in where the checks go, and they were putting the manufacturer's name that were manufacturing the product. So that was the second thing they were doing. The third thing they were doing was. <laughs> They had uh, their children who were eight and 10 years old as sales reps paying commissions to them. <laughs> <laughs> so 
actually what happened was um, the CFO of the company uh, actually figured out what was going on. And one day I got a call from the, one of the board members. I was the president of the company, but the two founders were there. And uh, I got a call from the, one of the board members and said, I need to meet with you. And I, I went to meet with him and he told me, uh, Shelly, listen, I think these two guys are stealing and the CFO thinks you're in on the deal. I said, what in on the deal? I just got here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, so I went back to the office, called my attorney, called the company's attorney, uh, explained to him what was going on at the uh, um, that the IRS was going to investigate them and the FBI was going to investigate them. And so they uh, called the company attorney and he came in and he terminated them, not me. He told them they had to go. And uh, because he was their attorney as well, he was the company attorney, but he was attorney for the two, uh, two owners. And he told them they had to go. And it was really interesting. They boxed up all kinds of stuff. And we called in a security company to watch them and they left. They just boxed up their, their stuff and left. A couple of days later, I'm in my office and my secretary calls me. Oh, I know what happened. One of the gentlemen from China who they, who they were in cahoots with was uh, our agent in China. And the agent was coming in to see me. And he comes into my office and I got a secretary downstairs who calls me and says, Shelly, the FBI is downstairs. They want to talk to Howard, who was the agent. <laughs> I, that was an hour and a half that he got into the country. <laughs> oh, geez. Good timing. <laughs> In any case, uh, it was quite an experience. Um, they both went to prison. Uh, I believe they got a year each. And uh, we don't know what happened to the money. We figure they sold somewhere between four and seven million dollars. Uh, but the company was in dire straits. Uh, it was a company making uh, um, oh, uh, it was a company making gift products, uh, some unique gift products, and they were very unique. Our, our biggest customer was Spencer Gifts, who liked to buy unique or risque product, and the company was kind of going downhill. So I figured the best thing to do was to, mer to find a buyer or merge it with somebody, which I did. I merged it with a company called Janix in New Jersey. And Janix's product was battery operated toothbrushes and clocks, which were mostly licensed product. And we were lucky enough to have at the time, or were able to acquire the two biggest licenses at the time were uh, Lion King, and Power Rangers, and I took the stock of the public company from forty-five dollars, forty-five cents a share, to seven dollars a share, and everybody was very happy. Unfortunately, in the licensing business, what happens is you go from great licenses like Lion King to not so great licenses like Pocahontas, and your business goes downhill. So I was there at Gen X for, I think, about, uh, I don't know, let me see here, about six or seven years. And I finally, uh, what happened was, uh, by the name of Howard Moore, who had been the executive vice president of Toys R Us, and he had a, a substantial investment in the company. He wanted to move to New Jersey uh, so I said, fine, great. And I just resigned from the company. By the way, I was very concerned because it was a public company and I was the only board member. The two other board members had resigned. So I had, and by the way, we had no liability insurance. So <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was quite concerned. So I was happy to resign. <laughs> and, uh, it was an interesting experience, Dave. I mean, uh, the two guys got out of prison, went back in business, and one of them has sub subsequently passed away, but the other one is still in business and doing this, the same kind of product. His company's called Can You Imagine, and he's in the gift business, and he's doing the same kind of product. It was, it was, some, it was an interesting experience. So let's switch a little bit here and... Uh... 
I want to talk about intuition or hunches a little bit. Well, in your decisions, uh, do you rely on your intuition or hunches? Or are you just data driven? Or what do you find was the most successful for you? Well, first of all, um, first of all, I, I, I have three mantras I've always lived by and 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 run my companies by. And one is uh, asking for help is not a sign of weakness because a lot of people get themselves in trouble because they don't ask for help. Okay. Secondly, don't do what you don't know how to do because you screw it up. And I've seen that happen so many times where people take on uh, tasks that they really are taking on because they want to, they want to show they can do it. I mean, they have to impress somebody or, or they're afraid if they don't do it, they'll, 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 you know, they'll get terminated. And the third thing is, if you don't like what you're doing, do something else. Those are my three mantras. In terms of intuition and so on, uh, I look at it this way. If, if it's something that's fact-related, if it has to do with finance, for example, I go, I go with the facts. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not looking at my intuition. I'm looking at the facts. If it's sales related, to a great extent, I look at the facts. What happened last year? What happened the year before? And uh, what the what does the product look like? It's going to do this year. What are the facts? Well, what what is the customer done? What is the customer done in this category of trade? I try to look at the facts around that customer and how to best design a program for them. In terms of intuition. I've always used intuition when it comes to product. Uh, um, um, there is there is no fact when it comes to product. You, you you know you can do all the focus research you want, and you can have people tell you, yeah, this is a good product, or you, or you, or you, or, you, or no, it's a bad product. And at Mattel, for example, we never came out with a product unless we did a, a great deal of focus group research. Well, I've seen a lot of products that people thought were great that I thought weren't so great. They weren't great, <laughs> and I and there, and there's a lot of products that I thought were great that people didn't think were great, and they were great. So when it comes, I use my intuition more when it comes to product product issues, and uh, than I do when it comes to to uh, issues like finance or sales. Um, I think I think sales to a great extent are fact related. What did the customer do last year? And why are they not buying? I mean, there's a, there's a reason why they're not buying from you. So, and it's fact related. It's either because they didn't have a good uh, experience with your product or they have no open to buy money or their boss has told them to cut back or whatever the case may be. It's not intuition. It's, it's fact related. You just have to delve in and find out what the facts are. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense, actually. I mean, if you're using left brain and logic, the facts are more important if it's a financial decision and uh, other right side of the brain, creative thinking, uh, intuition, I think, plays a a little bigger part of that. So it kind of makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, you you know, you you, intuition is really, uh, I mean, product is, even the people in the focus group are, are, are intuition driven. They're, they look at a product and they like it maybe because they think their kid's going to like it. Well, it isn't their kid that told them they liked it. By the way, we used to do focus group research with kids as well. We got better results from the focus group research with the kids than we did with the adults. Hmm. Because the kids were eventually going to wind up with the product anyway, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. Parents trying to decide whether the kid would like it. Well, the parents stuff. make a decision based on what they think and how much it costs. The kid makes a pure gut decision. I like it. I want to play with it, or I don't like it. I'm not going to play with it. You know. Well, what motivates you today? I mean, you could be retired, and you still choose to remain involved in business and consulting and helping businesses. So. Uh, well, I think, I think a couple of things. I think money, extra money never hurts, but that's not why I'm doing it. I do it because I like to keep my brain in, uh, uh, involved. I like to, I like to keep thinking. I like, I like 
I like challenges. I like when uh, somebody says to me, uh, I have, you know, I have this problem. How do I solve it? And, uh, you know, one of, one of the great things about consulting, Dave, is you don't have any responsibility. You tell people what you think and they either do it or they don't do it. And, <laughs> you, you know, you, you, it, does, it doesn't fall on you if they do it and it doesn't fall on you if they don't do it. So it's, it's really easier to be a consultant than it is to be a CEO. However, having said that, you really, in my case, you know, I've consulted for you, for example, from 10 years. So I feel I'm part of the company. And, um, but I do it because primarily because I like to keep my brain in action. And uh, uh, it's either that or, travel or play or play uh word games with my wife which i do by the way <laughs> <laughs> i mean playing word games and consulting keeps your brain active okay well what about some advice on uh following your passion i know a lot of people including myself uh maybe spent a lot of their life uh in a career or profession that they didn't really choose they were maybe uh, I don't know, me, for example, was kind of talked out of following my passion at an early age and teachers, guidance, counselors, family members kind of direct you in another way saying, well, you won't make any money in that field. And uh, someday you kind of get there and say, well, wait a second, am I really, is this my passion, what I'm doing? Uh, do you think you were always following your passion or were you just kind of directed well, into this where you ended up? Well, in the very, in the very, very beginning, the reason I went to Cornell was uh, I wanted to be a veterinarian. And um, there were only six colleges, in the, six veterinary colleges in the United States, and one of them was Cornell. Uh, and the uh, you pre-vet at Cornell was the same thing as pre-med, okay? You took the same kinds of courses, scientific courses, uh, organic chemistry, and so on, you know? And uh, I also played ball, by the way, which didn't help me <laughs> because um, uh, playing ball and taking organic, organic chemistry didn't, didn't go too well. So I gave up playing ball and, uh, and, and stuck to my studies. I determined pretty early on that it was very difficult, very, very difficult to get into veterinary school. It was more difficult to get into veterinary school than it was to get into medical school. Because, as I said, there were only six veterinary colleges in the United States, and there are many, many, many medical colleges, many medical schools. So I said, okay, what's next for me? Then I changed my major to business. Then I wanted, my second passion was I wanted to go into international trade, that is to, you know, go outside the country and work. And I, that's why I went to the Thunderbird School in Arizona, Thunderbird School of Global Management in Arizona, which specialized in international trade and had a great record of placing people in jobs uh, immediately at the college. Uh, interestingly enough, I did have a job offer um, from American Cyanamid to go to Venezuela. Um, in in uh, This was in 1960. And uh, but in those days, Venezuela was a great country. Uh, it was an interesting problem, which which I, I really don't want to get into. But at the end of the day, I didn't I didn't take the job, and I I moved back to Los Angeles, as I said, because I wanted to get married. And I said, okay, what do I want to do? And it seemed to me that the best thing I could do was sales. And of course, I was always pre I had a pretty good personality, and I thought that sales was a thing for me. Uh, and I've always focused on sales, even sales and marketing. Even when I was CEO of large companies, the thing for me that drove me was sales and marketing. I was always sales and marketing driven. I'm not operations driven or financial driven, although I can read a balance sheet and a P and L as well as anybody, and I understand operations. My passion was sales and marketing. And I like, what I like to see was overcoming a challenge. I'll give you a good example. As I said to you earlier, in, in toy business in the early 80s, and, and when I was there in the 70s, in the late 60s, early 70s, the, uh, uh, everything was written at Toy Fair. 
all the business for the year was written at Toy Fair, and then you shipped it throughout the year, and everybody paid for it in January. Uh, I had a big customer in Seattle, <laughs> and I would I, I I had antics that I would go through to to uh, uh, to to, uh, to impress a customer. One of my antics was. I was writing this order with this customer and the, the guy who owned the company was a really good friend of mine, but he wasn't writing the order. He had hired somebody to run, to actually run the company. And the guy he had gentleman had hired to run the company was writing the order and him, the owner and his wife and me and the salesman on the account and, and the person running, uh, writing the order all were in the room. And he's writing this order and he wasn't meeting my plan. Remember what I told you earlier. We had a plan for every customer by item. How much, how much are you going to write by item? What, what, what is the quantity? And this guy wasn't meeting my requirements. I got up from the table. I took the order and I tore it up and I said, I'm finished. And I walked <laughs> out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth Handler, I, I don't know if you know who Ruth Handler was. Ruth Handler was one of the owners of Mattel. She heard about this. And now I was a, I was a district manager. I was a low guy on a totem pole. We had a gigantic sales force. And she called me in her office. I'll never forget it. And she said, you know what, Shelly, I heard about this. And I want to award you a thousand shares, a thousand stock options. <laughs> so I got rewarded for my antics. And by the way, they came back the next day and we wrote the order I wanted. But, uh, and by the way, they sold all the goods. I mean, it, it, we didn't, we didn't screw them. We didn't oversell them. They sold all the goods. So it was, uh, it, it was <laughs> an interesting experience. I, I used to, Dave, I used to do stuff like, this was all sales driven. Right? Everything we did, we did for a reason. We had an office, a gigantic show in New York City in Madison Square, right, right to Penn Plaza, which was next to Madison Square Garden. And I remember one time to buy it from Toys R Us, who eventually became my partner. The gentleman was my partner at, uh, at Janix. He came into the office and was giving me a bad time. I... I jumped up on a desk and I started yelling at him. <laughs> so all of those things were antics. They were just, you can't do them today because in those days you could go to a customer and you could browbeat them or try to convince them that they were wrong about a product. Today, you cannot convince a product, a customer they're wrong about a product because they have more information than you do. I mean, they measure the sales at retail. So, by the way, one of the first retailers in the United States to do that was Toys R Us. And I remember the first or second time we went in there with our big spiel, you know, and our, our, our antics. And they said, no more antics. Here's the numbers, you know. And uh, it, it changed the way the business was run because the customer knew what was selling at retail. And today, of course, uh, you know, it's, it's all different. Mattel was one of the first ones to develop an EDI program where, where a business could come in or orders can come in directly online from a retailer. Uh, we, were, we were at Mattel way ahead of our time. All right. Well, we're getting close to one to wrap it up here, but last couple of questions for you. So, um, what about obstacles in your life? What do you think are some of the biggest ones you faced and how did you overcome them well, and what did you learn from them? Well, I mean, look, um, I, I, uh, as you know, no, I, I had personal obstacle in my life. I, I lost a, a son who was 34 years old and that, that was, uh, that was a major obstacle, uh, which, which is difficult to overcome. Um, uh, but what we did, I mean, you have to do that. I would say the biggest obstacle I had to overcome, honestly, the two biggest obstacles I had to overcome in, in, in business, uh, were, were, were this cold calling. I just, I, it was very difficult for me, but I, I learned how to, I, I learned how to overcome it. And the second biggest obstacle 
was learning how to fire people without feeling bad about it for the next week. <laughs> in terms of in terms of obstacles in my life, I mean, uh, you know, I've been very lucky. Um, uh, other than losing a child, I've, I've had a I had a pretty good run. I've been president of many companies. I've only been fired from one, and it was for a bad reason. Um, I've had ob- a number of my obstacles were being under finance and having to go to the banks to beg for money. Uh, I started my own company after I left Mattel. Uh, I'm sorry, after uh, after I left Stravina, after I retired, I started a little company with uh, with a Chinese partner and an American partner, and it was 2008, I believe. And getting uh, <laughs> retailers to buy anything new in, in, in the middle of the depression was very difficult. And the company went out of business. Uh, we, we just actually tried, interesting enough for you, Dave, we tried to convince the Chinese partner to start a personalized company. <laughs> and we, we had a, developed the business plan for it. And then we, got, and then we tried to talk uh, a couple of retail, um, not, I think uh, not a gun, I believe it was Gund or Gans. I don't remember which one it is, the, the, the uh, um, gift company. We tried to talk them into going into the personalized business, but were unsuccessful. We're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because the personalized business in terms of the mass has, has gone through cycles. It was, it goes up and, and goes down and now it's kind of like in a period where I think it may be time for it to come back. But the big obstacle was getting people to understand the personalized business and why they should go into it. And they, it's very difficult to explain it to them. As I've said to many times to people, uh, in the personalized business, you think you know it until you get into it, and then you learn that it's really not what you think it is. It's much more difficult. So, and you know that as well as anybody. So, yeah, for sure, it's uh, it doesn't look any different from any other business on the surface, but once you get in, you realize it's way different. Yeah, I think my biggest disappointment in in in, in business, by the way, if you you didn't ask me that, but my biggest disappointment was. I I have two things I always tell people as a consultant. Don't have one product and don't have one customer. Uh, at Stravina, we were doing about 35% of our business with Toys R Us. I mean, I'm sorry, with Walmart. And uh, it enabled us to go to vendors in China and negotiate good pricing because we, were, we could guarantee them so much business from Walmart. And one day Walmart called us up and said, you know what, <clears throat> this is too high an investment per square foot. Uh, we're going to change to binders or something. <laughs> and we'll get, we're, we're doing away with personalized business. Well, that was 35% of our business. And after that, it became much more difficult to, uh, to maintain the business. Uh, frankly, I left. I think had I stayed, I would have been able to. Stravino went out of business two years after I left. I, they, I think they made some strategic mistakes or some tactical mistakes. For example, they, uh, when I left, they hired very high priced people. They made a decision that, oh, it's the 20% of the names that do 80% of the business. So we'll only put 20% of the names on the racks. They, 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 what they should have done was cut their overhead substantially to, uh, to service a, a business that was not going to be a hundred million, but was maybe going to be sixty million or fifty million, and not and to do personalized the way it was supposed to be done, uh, but they didn't do that, so they eventually went out. Okay, well, I've got one last question for you. So, based on all your years of experience, what kind of advice would you have for the next generation of business leaders? Oh. I'm, I'm concerned about the next generation of business leaders because I'm concerned about millennials and how they operate and how they think. And I mean, when I was young, Dave, and I looked to hire people, if somebody had more than three or four jobs or five jobs in, in a short period of time, I probably wouldn't have even spoken to them. Millennial, <clears throat> millennials today can have five jobs in three years, you know? Because they're mo- they're much more concerned with 
the advantages, the personal advantages for working for a company rather than the challenges of working for a company. They're interested in what are the benefits and how much time off and can I work from home and so on. So th their mindset is different. And, uh, uh, they're, they're just different. But, to, but the advice I would give to people and the advice I would have given to myself if I were 20 years old was, number one, listen. If you don't listen, you don't learn. If you don't listen, you really don't know what's happening. If you don't listen, you're going to miss the, the points at which you can make a sale, for example. I mean, you have to listen. And most people don't. They just keep, they just think it's, you go in a room and you sit there and if you try to, you know, if, if it goes from one to four seconds or five seconds, somebody has to say something, you know, you have to listen to the other person. The second piece of advice I would give the young people is have patience. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day and, and you're not going to become chairman of the company in a day. You have to have patience. And those are the two best pieces of advice I would give to people. Make sure you listen and make sure you have patience. All right. We can't argue with that. Definitely great advice. Well, thank you so much, Shelley, for taking the time to talk to us and provide such great insights for our audience. I really appreciate your honesty and insight, and I'm sure our guests are going to enjoy what you had to say. Okay, David, it's been a pleasure, and I appreciate uh, being on your show. Thanks. All right. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye. Bye.